Aline is seen leaving her classroom, then entering a faculty bathroom. Then you see Philip peeking out of the classroom, maybe thinking that he's not going to follow her. Then he comes back out, pulls up his hood, and you can see Philip following along and looking like he's putting on gloves, then walking into that same bathroom. Philip was in the bathroom attacking Colleen for 11 minutes. And then you see a female student open up the bathroom door and quickly turn around. She opened the door and apparently just saw a naked butt and kind of got embarrassed that she walked in on somebody using the bathroom. She didn't see Colleen though. So after that, that must have spooked Philip because Philip immediately leaves after that. Then you can see Philip walking down the hallway holding something. He goes into the stairwell, still has his hood up, and he's now on the first floor. Here you can see his hand is completely red as he's walking through the hallway. Then the next time he's on surveillance, you can see Philip in the school parking lot. Philip is now in a white shirt. He passes a teacher and runs back up to the second floor, back to Colleen's classroom. Next, he grabs all of Colleen's belongings and his stuff and walks down the hall. Before he is seen walking down the stairs, he now has a red sweatshirt kind of laid over his head to conceal his identity. And the next time he comes back up the stairs, he is wearing a full black ski mask. And he puts on his red sweatshirt before he runs down the hallway. Now, for some reason in between that, he took off the mask, and I'm not sure why. But next, you can see him in the hallway running from another student with a soccer ball. And the student's kind of like, hey, what are you doing? But Philip keeps running. Next, you can see Philip running down the stairs again, but this time when he returns, he has a green recycle bin, and he wheels it up to the second floor and then into the bathroom. From there, he takes the red sweatshirt off, puts the mask back on, and wheels Colleen down the elevator and out of the building. Next, he is outside, wheeling the re recycling bin toward the woods, kind of struggling with the weight of it because Colleen's inside. And after seven minutes, he's back on camera, wheeling the recycle bin back, and you can tell now that the bin is way lighter than it was before. When Philip starts to walk closer to the camera, you can see that he's no longer wearing shoes as he walks back into the school. By the time he makes it to the stairs and back to the second floor, you can see on Philip's jeans and can now clearly see that he is barefoot. He goes back down the hall, walking very slowly at first, and then rushes into a different bathroom where he changes into his soccer clothes, but is still not wearing shoes. Then he goes back to the bathroom where he attacked Colleen one more time before heading down the stairs and outside of the school like nothing ever happened. Diana, Philip's mom, contacted the Danvers Police Department. She contacted them to report that her son, Philip, had not come home from school after soccer practice. She said that she went to the school and the athletic facility, and he was not anywhere to be seen, but his teammates said that Philip had mysteriously vanished and actually completely missed practice at 4 p.m. The last time they saw him, they say he was running away from the soccer field in the complete opposite direction. So, after calling the police, Diana went down to the station and filed a missing persons report. While there, she gave the police Philip's phone number, hoping that they'd be able to ping him, to track him, to figure out where he had gone and what his location was. And luckily, they did, in fact, get a hit. The most recent ping location was earlier that afternoon at 4.28 p.m. It pinged near a movie theater called the Hollywood Hits Theaters. So Denver police go to this movie theater to conduct a canvas search, where they learned that Philip did in fact buy a movie ticket, watched the movie, and then left. But after that, they weren't able to find any phone pings. They couldn't trace his whereabouts after that. They didn't know his, know his location. And none of this made any sense to Diana, his mom. Once the news spread, Danvers High School principal, Sue Ambrosevich, sent out a mass email to all of the school staff around 9 p.m., letting everybody know that Philip was missing. And after this mass email went out, the principal received a phone call from a woman named Sarah. She was a math teacher at Danvers High School. And this math teacher, Sarah, told the principal that she received a call from another math teacher named Colleen's parents, Tom and Peggy. And Tom and Peggy told Sarah that their daughter, Colleen, also a math teacher, follow me here, guys, follow me here, guys, that she didn't come home from school that day. And they believed that she, too, was missing. So let's go back to Philip. Just a few hours after he was reported as missing, around 12.30 a.m., Topsfield police were called about pedestrian walking alongside the highway, walking in the wrong direction. The police found this person, and the responding officer, Neil Hovey, realized that the individual walking was that missing teenager from Danvers. 
Philip Chisholm. So when officers first saw Philip, they noticed that he had a ski mask pulled down around his neck, which initially didn't seem all that weird because it was late October in Massachusetts and it was freezing outside. But he told Officer Hovey that he was coming from Tennessee and he said that he was going nowhere. That is a direct quote. He also said he didn't have an address and that in his backpack he had a bunch of survival gear. So this officer did a very quick pat down on Philip, just for safety reasons, and he discovered that there was a rock in, a po in one of his pockets and also a credit card. The credit card had a woman's name on it, Colleen Ritzer. But the name didn't mean anything to the officer at the time because no reports had been put out about Colleen is missing and nobody had connected those dots yet. Philip said that he got the credit cards at a stop and shop convenience store. But this officer saw this underage kid, a situation that wasn't really feeling right, so he put him in the back of the police cruiser so that he could warm up, and then he took him to the police station so they could figure out what the heck was going on. While they were at the police station, the officers at the station made a very disturbing discovery when they asked Philip about the backpack that he was carrying with him with that survivalist gear. An officer asked him, is there anything in here that can hurt me? And Philip responded, yes. Inside the backpack, he found a stained box cutter. So he asked, where did the from come from that's on this? And he said, the girl. And then the officer asked, where's the girl? And Philip said, in the woods. After Colleen's parents, the principal, and a few others had gone to the school earlier that evening to look for Colleen, another teacher had come to help. This was another math teacher. It's like this band of bandits with math teachers here. And his name's Todd Buttersworth. And while searching for Colleen, Todd found a school bag wedged in between boulders at the edge of the woods near the school. So Todd decided to go a little further into the woods, but immediately stopped in his tracks when he stumbled upon a pair of white, bloody gloves. And he then immediately notified the police, basically raising his hand and saying, you know, I found something. Officer Stephanie Wennenberger was the first cop on the scene to help in this search for poor Colleen. While inside the school, she searched in the bathrooms next to Colleen's classroom, but noticed that it was very recently cleaned and also smelled like disinfectant. However, around the waist level of the wall was a reddish handprint with streaks. So this officer, once notified of the school bag that the math teacher Todd had found, began searching in the woods next to where the bag was found, where she found paper, shreds of clothing, two blue and white Under Armour gloves covered in blood, and other evidence kind of scattered about. Now, this was extremely alarming, and officers now realized the gravity of the situation. Officer Ellington and his cadaver dog, Falco, were called in to help investigate further. Falco pulled Officer Ellington into the woods and then drew him to an area where he saw a gray, soaked sneaker. Then Falco went even higher up the hill and dove into a gully where there was a large green recycling bin lying on its side. So officers blocked off a 6 by 10 square foot area of the woods, which contained blood, leaves, sticks, and it almost looked like a gravesite. And as police searched further, one of the officers at the scene pointed out a human toe with pink toenail polish on it, poking out from underneath the leaves. The officers continued to process what was now obviously an official crime scene, and they began to uncover a body under those leaves, which was identified as Colleen. Colleen was found lying on her back, covered in leaves in a way that was so obvious that whoever did this intended to, to conceal her body. Her throat was slit, her shirt was lifted above her breasts, and her bra was pulled down below, leaving them exposed. She was also naked from the waist down. There were red and brown bloodstains on her face and her torso, and her legs were spread apart and slightly bent in a sexually staged manner. There was also a three foot long and one inch in diameter tree branch that was inserted inside her Later, the medical examiner collected male fluid that was inside Colleen and found that she was stabbed at least eight times in the neck. So either completely unbeknownst to Philip or he just didn't care, the school had recently installed 140 surveillance cameras throughout their entire campus. So everything was about to blow up in Philip's face. Danvers police reviewed the security footage from the high school CCTVs the very next day, and the police created a minute-by-minute -minute account of everything that happened that afternoon. So immediately after this horrific murder and assault, 
Philip used Colleen's credit cards, and he used them to buy a cheeseburger at Wendy's and then go to that theater and watch a Woody Allen movie before the police found him that night after midnight. So Philip was ultimately charged with two counts of RAPE, armed robbery, and first-degree murder, and he was charged as an adult at just 14 years old. So while awaiting trial, apparently officers were investigating the validity of a very disturbing tip and lead that they received, which, are you ready for this? Officers said that they were following up on a lead that this soccer star, this 15, this 14-year-old kid, now 15, who's accused of brutally murdering this beloved teacher, Colleen, that he got a twisted thrill from setting pet cats on fire. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, if this is true, what the heck is wrong with this guy? But also, does this show a clear pattern of escalation. Prosecutors for Phillip's trial asked for more strict security after he allegedly also attacked a female youth worker that month. Court papers reveal that Philip, who was now at the time 15 years old, had slipped away from his caregivers, crept along a common hallway, crouched down out of view, then followed this female youth worker to a locker room, choked her, and beat her around the head and face, all well armed with a pencil. Other workers came to the woman's aid when she was screaming, and they restrained him, luckily. Court documents also said that he appeared to be psychotic and was out of touch with reality, yelling, screaming incoherently, foaming out at the mouth like a rabid dog while being restrained by staff. So after that, he was committed to a mental hospital for 30 days of evaluation and treatment. Leading up to the trial, Assistant DA Kate McDougall said that nothing during the investigation had pointed to a mental health issue. But Philip's lawyer, Denise Reagan, said that she would raise the issue of mental competency if and when she felt it was appropriate, which, whatever that means. And Philip's trial was absolutely bat crazy. And it revealed even more disturbing details, as if it, that's even physically possible at this point. Once the trial started, the prosecution did not play. They came in hot. And let me just tell you, Kate McDougall was like ready to drag Philip. She came out of the gate hot. And honestly, I'm here for it. So in the prosecutor's opening statements, she said that Philip arrived at school, that he had a blue sweatshirt with a hood, gloves, a mask, and a box cutter, that he wasn't crazy when he killed Colleen, that this was calculated. He was focused and unwavering from his horrible plan to take what he wanted. And as a quote, she says, he had a goal, a terrible, terrible purpose, and he played it out in the woods and he didn't care what came after that. They also claimed that Colleen was incapacitated, but not dead, when she got into the woods, meaning that she was still alive as he was wheeling her out of that school in the green recycling bin. They say that's where he carved those deep wounds and finished his sexual attack on her. His defense said that while he was attacking Colleen, he was not a kind, smart 14-year-old boy. He was responding to those terrible commands that were hallucinations in his head and that he did not choose to do this. So now the question is, was Philip in the throes of psychosis and couldn't help but listen to these alleged voices in his head? Or is he a malicious, manipulative, dangerous little prick who is faking a mental illness now because he got caught? That was gonna be up to the 12 people on the jury who have no medical education because that makes perfect sense, right? Let them decide. During the course of the entire trial, jurors saw the chilling videos of Philip following Colleen into the bathroom. The prosecutor, nearly yelling at times, walked them through Philip's movements, checking his pocket for the box cutter, putting his hoodie on, putting on the gloves, opening the bathroom door, and then wheeling the recycle bin out. And she said, and I quote, But all of those images, while they show deliberate premeditation, don't matter as much as one. The only still image that matters in this case is the image of Colleen in the woods, the image that the defendant painted of Colleen, stripped, battered, brutalized, and violated. The defense was able to get Philip's initial conversation and confession where he told the police about the girl and the woods thrown out. But fortunately, the case was so strong from that video and the physical evidence. And I mean, it's just unreal. Like, thank goodness for all of those video cameras. So the verdict finally comes in and Philip was found guilty of murder, 
rape and robbery and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after serving 40 years. He's currently at a supermax prison in Lancaster, Massachusetts, and Colleen's family was extremely disappointed in this because they wanted Philip to have life in prison without the possibility of parole. Throughout the trial, Philip also didn't appear to show an ounce of remorse and looked completely just devoid of all emotion completely, which combined with this heinous crime suggests to me that he's seriously a psychopath. Like, I get it, I'm not a doctor, and that's not a diagnosis, it's just my opinion, but, like, to be that cold, that callous, there's something else going on, and you're, like, lighting cats on fire, bro, the writing's on the wall. After Philip's conviction, Colleen's family filed a wrongful death suit naming the town of Danvers, the school district, and the school's cleaning company for cleaning up potential evidence. They were not after money for themselves, but they wanted any proceeds to benefit school safety programs and a charity in Colleen's name. Ultimately, the lawsuit asked for answers, like why nobody was monitoring those surveillance cameras in real time, why Philip was just allowed to roam the school visibly showing which are all pretty fair points, if I'm going to be honest. And the lawsuit was finally settled in August of 2022 for an undisclosed amount.